uh, can I welcome you all here today in, this, uh, in the latest series of uh, these discussions in these uh, seminar series. Uh, I, I, I obviously, Fiona has already said, I want to apologise in advance, I have to leave. The Justice Committee sits at, at 2 o'clock, so, and the Chair may not be there. And, and, and particular is one of the issues which we're discussing in the prison estates, and we're getting a briefing this afternoon with that. Uh, I think these type of uh, discussions are, are well placed within this building, and certainly I, I am someone who's been on the, uh, the Justice Committee from its inception, and certainly it, it was a very steep learning curve for myself, and I know that many of the people here who have provided papers to this seminar have been some of the papers which our committee has used to inform ourselves uh, about many of the issues <coughs> which we deal with. The issue of youth justice has obviously received a greater prominence in, in recent times and recent years. And in particular, we had the, the, the publication of the review of the youth justice system. And that was one of the issues which actually came out of the, the Hillsborough Agreement, because we felt it was important that it was an opportunity to do this. Uh, the youth justice issues has been a particular focus of our committee in, in recent days. And we have obviously now seen the recommendations we met with the review team and we obviously uh, took evidence both as a committee and the party separately and many of the people whose, whose uh, views, whose research papers have actually helped uh, bring about the publication of the, the review. And I think it, it, it's, it's very, very interesting because even last week uh, our committee, some of the members of the committee were in Westminster and we met with our sort of counterparts in the Justice Committee in London and they were actually here recently and they are very, very keen uh, on many of the, <coughs> excuse me, many of the issues which uh, we are pioneers of in terms of diversionary work and, de and dealing with young people. And I think it was very encouraging for ourselves to see the Justice Committee there were paying a particular attention to it. And we ourselves, as a committee and, and the party separately, uh, we have visited Woodlands and we have been to Hyde Bank, and, and, and it's that hands-on and, and going out and meet the various agencies that you get. The, the breadth of experience and, and the depth of work which has been carried out. Uh, as part of our consideration, <clears throat> we have looked at the, the issue of uh, avoidable delay in the criminal justice system, and we see that right across uh, the, the sector, not just in terms of, of youth work, but certainly all the evidence that we have been presented with is that most people say that the sooner you get young people in the system and out of it, then there's a less likely chance of them being part of that system in the future, and that's what we need to be doing. So that's why we have considered and we've looked at all our jurisdictions in terms of this idea of a, of a statutory time limit, and that's something which we as a party have also uh, uh, supported. The committee visited the, the whole youth uh, triad system, and again we were impressed by how a focused piece of work and Fiona provided the, the the committee with the, the research paper, but we are certainly uh, were encouraged by the stuff which they have pioneered and where they see the benefit of it, and I think we have many, many lessons to learn. Certainly now this week it's become very topical. The Minister uh, uh, has announced his uh, review of the prison estates, and one of the key findings is, be, is the concept of a, of a secure college, and again from uh, examination of our jurisdictions, we have seen how that can be beneficial. And uh, as I said previous, we are now getting a briefing on that this afternoon because that's something which we are very, very interested in. Because one of the things that actually struck me personally is in the last mandate, our committee visited Hyde Bank, and you know you go in there, and the governor, in fairness to him, uh, did a presentation. And, and one of the things which he actually said is that most of the people that he had in his custody shouldn't be there. And then he outlined the reasons why. And, and it, was a, you know, it was a very honest, and uh, I think it shook many of us, you know, and I even seen some people who maybe, and, and I hope I'm not being unkind, who maybe had been, you lock them up and throw away the key. I think it started to, they started to realise that some of the people that we have in our custody are people that shouldn't be in. So I want to wish, <clears throat> Wish you well. I am I'm obviously, as much as I can, will we'll listen to Una and Linda's presentations, and then Tracy and John uh, will be doing that summary. But I have absolutely no doubt that the clerk of the committee and Fiona, as our, our, our researcher, uh, will ensure that the papers which you are presenting here today and our papers which you have 
that I conducted in the past that will be given to our committee. I want to apologise for my sore throat as well. My wife says it's the worst case of man flu she's had to deal with in the last 12 months from last year at this time, so Gourmet Oga Folk, yeah. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, for Linda's and my presentation, we're going to focus on some of the key issues raised by the Youth Justice Review Team in 2011. Yeah. The state has ratified the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child and as highlighted in the policy brief, uh, that signifies a commitment to respect, protect and fulfil the rights of children as contained within the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child. By incorporating the best interest principle within the youth justice legislation, this will go some way towards addressing previous failures to place significant emphasis on the best interests of children, particularly in relation to youth justice. However, it's vital to take account of the range of international instruments for um, youth justice uh, in order to ensure that legislation, policy and practices do comply with human rights standards, children's rights. In relation to the minimum age of criminal responsibility, it was introduced or set at 10 in 1968, apparently in the absence of any um, evidence-based rationale. And the failure to raise the age of criminal responsibility causes a number of concerns. It's described by the UN Committee on the Rights of the Child as internationally unacceptable. Any failure to raise this age raises questions about the apparent commitment to children's rights, the diversion of children from the criminal justice system, from prosecution and from custody. Also, if policymakers are committed to evidence-based policy, consideration must be given to the evidence that highlights, and this is increasing evidence, highlighting that raising the age of criminal responsibility is of benefit not only to children, but to their families and to the wider community. This is particularly true in relation to the development of appropriate community-based, non-criminal justice-based services and programs that should accompany the raising of the age. Raising the age of criminal responsibility does not mean that children's behaviour is condoned. Rather, as the European network of ombudspersons for children highlight, it, it presents the opportunity to provide a new approach, an alternative approach, that is more appropriate and more effective than the current approach in relation to children. I'm moving on to delays, um, which have been mentioned already, and the commitment has been emphasised in relation to delays. In order to realise this commitment, it is vital that the Youth Justice Review Team's recommendation that a statutory time limit for arrest, from arrest to disposal be implemented. There are concerns that an introduction of a time limit from a later point um, would lead or result in um, having an impact in relation to practical and psychological disadvantages for children. I'm moving on now specifically to detention. The failure to use custody as a last resort um, has been evident throughout Northern Ireland for decades. And it is a stark example of the abuse of children's rights. Children are being held in custody as a place of safety. Children are more likely than adults, significantly more likely than adults, to be remanded in custody. There's also an overrepresentation of children um, from looked after care, from the care system within the um, detention centre. So it is vital that a commitment is made to providing adequate provision and to take adequate steps to eventually end this abuse of children's rights. 
in order to facilitate the implementation of the review team's recommendations, which include bail support, accommodation where required, uh, more resources need to be put into focusing on provision within the community. More resources need to be put into focusing on the approach adopted by police and the courts. Now, quite often, and in Linda's in my own research back in 2006, those who we interviewed highlighted that children may end up in detention inappropriately and unnecessarily due to the notion that there isn't any alternative. So a commitment is needed to provide those alternatives to custody. We know from a um, whole range of international research that the use of custody um, for children and for adults as well is extremely expensive and particularly expensive in the Northern Ireland uh, situation and it's also um, ineffective in terms of dealing with offending and reoffending. And as the American scholar and practitioner Jerome Murray Miller, so I said in 1991, um, the hard truth is, if ju juvenile penal institutions have minimal impact on crime, and if most prisons were closed tomorrow, the rise in crime would be negligible. And so Jerome Miller has suggested that locking people up as the major tenet of crime control is what he called questionable social policy. And so it's clear that we are using question questionable social policy here in Northern Ireland as long as we continue to lock up children uh, that, that really don't need to be locked up. Reducing the use of custody would both, we would argue, promote the health and well-being of children and, counterintuitively, it would have a positive impact on youth offending rates. Professor Jap Duke, a uh, former chairperson of the United Nations Committee on the Rights of the Child, agrees with that and he has stressed that meeting our international obligations in terms of children's rights, including, including reducing the use of custody, would not only promote children's well-being, but would reduce uh, re-offending. You know, any, any statistics that we look at show that custody um, really has the very high reconviction rates for children coming out. Uh, we're talking about over 70% of children coming out of custody in Northern Ireland go on to re-offend. And that's despite uh, the excellent work that has been well documented in um, criminal justice inspection reports coming from uh, who, inspecting woodlands. We know that desisting from crime can present very significant difficulties for young people and we really shouldn't underestimate that um, you know it's very easy to think that children can you know should be able to come out of custody and should be able to desist from offending um, but a lot of research suggests that that's a very difficult process for them. And in a report um, called She's a Legend, um, which um, I recently did research for, uh, was produced by the Children's, Children's Commissioner, uh, Nikki, and conducted with myself, Agnieszka Martinovich, and Azrini Wahadin, uh, who's here today. Um, what we found was that children really, really struggle in a lot of ways um, with issues which make it difficult for them to make the transition out of custody the transition out of offending. The title, She's a Legend, refers to one of the um, staff in the Juvenile Justice Centre who was providing a lot of support for children and young people. And what we found was that it's very difficult for young people, um, you know, their, their friends might be also offending, there may be family difficulties, difficulties with accommodation, and we shouldn't see desistance as an easy process for young people. In terms of children's social and health needs, um, we know that those are very wide. Um, Professor Barry Golson, a uh, university uh, in Liverpool, has talked about the situation uh, for children in England and Wales. And he's noted that child prisoners are, in his words, routinely drawn from some of the most structurally disadvantaged and impoverished families, neighbourhoods and communities. We don't have that kind of research that Professor Golson has done uh, in terms of the social and health needs of children in custody here. And we really need intensive research looking at children's needs both in the community and in, uh, the children, in terms of children in woodlands and in terms of children in Hydebank Wood. 
We do know from inspection reports um, that, as the inspector said, many children who enter the juvenile justice centre are in poor physical and mental health as they have limited access to uh, healthcare services in their own community. In a snapshot of children held in Woodlands in 2007, the inspectors found uh, high levels of children with diagnosed mental health disorders, high levels of histories of self-harm, high levels of children who tried to take their own lives. Not surprisingly then, that makes the transition from custody to community extremely difficult. And the Youth Justice Review um, commented on that when they said that they, they put down the high reconviction rate for children as reflecting the lack of adequate preparation for release and inadequate post-support release. I want to say something particular about um, the continued um, imprisonment of under 18s in prison service custody. And I, I know that um, there are not under 18 year olds in prison service custody at the minute, but we would see this as a particularly, as a continuing issue and an issue of real concern. Um, when we were talking about um, preparing for this presentation, Una and I noted that it's, um, it's reflecting our age, I suppose, as well. We noted that we first met in the 1990s, um, and we met over 15 years ago as a direct concern of both of our, our joined concern about children's rights particularly, but particularly about the rights of children in custody. And at that time in the 1990s, we were both really concerned about children being held in adult jails. At that time, Una was conducting her PhD interviews, and she talked about the very sad experience of interviewing 14-year-old um, Annie Kelly, who was at that time in McGabry Adult Prison. Annie Kelly had a history of self-harm um, and mental health difficulties that are now well documented by the Human Rights Commission, amongst others. And in McGabry, Annie, uh, at the age of 14, was routinely strip-searched, she was subject to forcible restraint. She was locked down in an isolation cell um, for, for lengthy periods to the, to the extent that one of the punishment cells in McGabry became known as Annie's cell um, and that was expected where she would be held. According to the official narrative, the treatment of Annie, her restraint, her strip searching, her, her being held in the cell was for her own protection, to protect her life. Yet age 19, Annie was found hanging in a strip cell in McGabry in September 2002. And it was Annie's death that in part, in a large part, led to the Human Rights Commission um, being concerned about the uh, conditions for women in custody. The jury into, uh, into the inquest into Annie's death found that defects in the prison system had contributed to her death. So it's really difficult and, and it makes us angry to be, um, to be here today um, considering that um, the Department of Justice is still considering that in exceptional circumstances, children under the age of 18 will be imprisoned with young adults um, in Hyde Bank Wood. The Minister of Justice, David Ford, as it said in the slide, has announced that the detention of all under 18s will cease, but for the most exceptional circumstances. And from our point of view, we have heard this all too often. When we when we pleaded, there's no other word for it, when we pleaded with Northern Ireland office officials um, regarding Annie Kelly's case and uh, regarding the detention of children in adult jails, we were told Annie Kelly is an exceptional case. We've seen other exceptional cases uh, referred to since, the de since Annie's death and we're now hearing yet again in 2013 that in exceptional cases, children will be held in Hyde Bank Wood. We know that the, uh, that the department is, has been thinking around how it would, how it would put, um, um, I think, lock, locking devices in place so that so that, that, that really would be exceptional. Um, but as far as we're concerned, this is, this is uh, really in breach of Article 37 of the Convention of the Rights of the Child, and it should never happen, absolutely never, and there, there should be no exceptions. 
That's particularly the case because, as, as Tracy and John will be talking about, we know that conditions in Hyde Bank Wood are, uh, are dreadful in terms of overemphasis on security, long periods of lockdown, um, and I won't take up time going into it because the Chair has talked about it. That doesn't mean that the situation for girls in custody is resolved. Um, Again, we were remembering that we've been promised research into the situation around girls in custody in Northern Ireland um, since the turn of the century. And as far as I'm aware, that research still hasn't happened. And we need it because policy in girls needs to be evidence-based. So we've a number of conclusions, really, which I'll not read out, and which back, back up um, the recommendations of the Youth Justice Review. What I want to say in conclusion is that really to make sure that those happen, we need independent oversight. And as far as we can see, that isn't happening. We do have an independent oversight team um, looking at the situation and monitoring the situation in regard to adult prisoners and the prison review team's uh, report. And we're saying to you here, children should not be second class citizens. Children deserve an independent, and that's the important word, an independent oversight team just as much as adults do, and we really would like the committee to look again at the need for, for independent oversight. Thanks very much, and we hand over to uh, Tracy and John. In the presentation that I want to make today, on behalf of myself and John McCord from the, Univer the University of Ulster, <coughs> is going to actually look at, take the rights that you have talked about there, and look at the realities of implementing an educational system for children and young people in custody. Oops. Okay, so who are we and why are we interested in this particular topic? Uh, John and myself are both researchers, as Una and Linda are, from the University of Ulster. John, from a legal background, has looked at the rights of children, um, and I am a more... Uh, my background as a practitioner in essential skills, I've had a background in essential skills and also in prison education, having delivered uh, in McGabry Prison at the time when Linda talked about when everybody was held there, young offenders, male, female, uh, as well as paramilitary and non-paramilitary groups. So that's where our interest stands for, stems from today. Okay, um, when you think of a prison or a young offender centre, it's a very unique environment. Uh, it's one of the, the uh, only environments that I know that is what I would des describe as architecturally hostile. Uh, you, you're de you're, uh, they want to keep you out and they also want to keep the people who are in there securely contained within the facility as well. So it's not an easy place to get in and out of. Again, barbed wire, you know, the actual physical space is not very conducive to learning. But also the, uh, the shared space, if you like, as well. Some of the words there that I've used, and I know Linda talked about a particular case there. But bullying, the idea of when, when young men who are aggressive are all contained together, uh, the option for bullying, self-harm, drug taking, violence, all of that's palpable in a prison setting for anyone who has ever been there. And it's not conducive to learning. It's a very difficult environment to conduct educational, uh, any sort of learning activities at all. Okay, again, this is uh, a bit repetitive because Linda has already covered some of this. But again, within the, the, the youth custody setting, uh, the young people there are very troubled, very disaffected high levels of literacy and numeracy, and that was my own particular area of expertise um, in, in terms of my teaching. Mental health difficulties, ADHD, all the, the sorts of things that um, typify disaffected young people, disrupted family lives. Um, so really, you know, we're dealing with people who are working in, in educational settings in the prison or youth custody are dealing with some very difficult students. Um, and again, what they've got to do is actually move away from seeing the prisoner or the young person as the problem and moving them towards the right-hand side of the, the screen there, someone with potential, someone we can actually work with. It's quite a big mindset for a tutor going in as well because, again, the, the kind of terms that we talk about, drug dealers, joyriders, hoods, thugs, described in the press as monsters, you know, these young thugs. What we're trying to do and what we need to do is to move that negative connotations and that whole dichotomy of negative and positive to be closer together so that we can actually start to focus on these young people as individuals, people with potential, and actually citizens who we hope will go out into the world, have families of their own, 
and be productive citizens in, in terms of, of the lives that they lead and the impact that they can have. So it's about getting that mindset, not just with the tutors and the teachers who are working with them, but as society as a whole, and making them realise that the costs um, of custody are just not worth it in, in terms of having this negativity. Okay, so present education as it stands at the minute, um, it's, it's very difficult because the idea and, and the, the rationale behind replicating the school-based environment is very much uh, with the thought that they can then transition out and take up educational opportunities in the wider world. But the rights and the realities are very different. And those young people are not, they, they don't want to go back into that situation. It has failed them a traditional classroom situation. Teacher, student, doesn't work and they have no interest, for the most part, in taking up those opportunities. The learning is linked to behaviour. If they um, are you know, uh, problematic or whatever, they can have some of their lessons taken away. So there, there's, there's a, a link there which isn't particularly good when we're trying to foster an idea of learning. Emphasis is on, on employability, and again, that's good. We're not saying that that isn't good. What we're saying is that, at the moment, many of those young people are not ready for employability. They don't have those skills. They don't even have the examples from their own family, intergenerational unemployment, um, in the areas that they come from. Uh, career aspirations are not very high. So they don't have that vision of themselves. Their learning identity does not necessarily equate to a job. So we're, we're not saying that there's anything wrong with focusing on employability skills. But what we're saying is at the minute, the emphasis and the balance is, is wrong. Again, limited use of technology. We all know the problems uh, that that would create in the wider world. Oh, those uh, young hoods and young thugs are all spent every day surfing on the internet. The reality is that that's the way learning is going. And that's the way we need to be able to equip these young people so that they can go out into the wider world. The other issue about technology is that it allows those young people to be part of a wider community. Um, an e-learning community. And I'll come on to that in a wee minute. The other issue is, and again this is from my own experience and from the research that I have subsequently gone on to do, there is no specific training for prison teachers. Uh, you go in on your first day and you have no idea what to expect. Um, but actually you need a very different set of skills to deal with those disaffected learners. The equipment you use, the materials for, for teaching maths, just to give an example, a compass or a protractor, can be used as a weapon. So obviously you've got to be very careful about how, the, the normal things that you would take in for your class as resources. You have to be very careful about them. In Europe, and I was part of a European project just recently with Grundvig, um, they do have induction training for specifically for prison teachers as part of teacher training. And that's something that we might want to look at here as well so that we can equip uh, the teachers to deal with those young people more effectively. Again, it ties in very much to, to the work you talked about, Linda, there, where there are opportunities for significant adults, important adults that they're working with every day, to really make that difference and that impact in their lives. Okay, so we want to set out a new vision, really. Um, and it, it might sound like, you know, uh, oh, this is grand in theory, but, you know, the, the cost of not implementing this work uh, are not just financial, because we know it costs much, much more to keep a young person. We know how expensive it is to keep a young person in prison. But there's also that opportunity cost, that lifestyle cost, if you like, um, by continually putting people into the system, whereby they, they are very much unable to get out of that system. So the costs are huge if we continue to work in the way we are doing at the minute. We're suggesting that, uh, and again, from my own experience and my own uh, research, we're not saying that there's no learning going on in the prison or in the youth, youth custody system. Learners are engaging in all different kinds of activities. They're playing on their playstations, they're going to the gym, they're reading books. Again, it's all, uh, it's all going on in a much more informal capacity. And what we need to do is to try and capture that, if you like, into a humanistic model where we can uh, look at what they're already doing and direct that into a more formal approach. So we're taking their self-directed learning episodes, if you like, and actually starting to build on those to tie in to the, to the curriculum. Experiential approaches, the use of mentors in the on wings, people who um, 
are, you know, are trained and, and will help and, and be that critical friend, if you like, to those young people. The idea of social learning and shared learning. Again, lots of learning going on. It's how we harness that and, and uh, capture it and, and make it into something that is positive learning because there's lots of learning also going on in these places, which is negative learning. And that's why you will get uh, people talking about prisons and, and youth offender centres as universities of crime, where they just learn they learn lots of new things, but it's not what we want them to learn. So we need to harness some of what's already going on, contextualise it. If they're interested in football, let's work with them on that. If they're interested in pop music, let's work with them on that. Rather than trying to pigeonhole their particular interest into a very strict and rigid set of curriculum guidelines that are imposed, rather than negotiated and shared. Okay, so some of the ideas, and I know Raymond, when he was here earlier on, talked about the idea of an offender campus. If we can't get an offender campus where the main focus is solely on rehabilitation, then at least let's have some learning wings, if you like, where people who are all engaged in the learning process can be put together and allowed to form a community of practice. Again, I talked about there the idea of e-learning communities. The, uh, Architecture of technology, architecture of technology now, can be put in place so that learners can't, uh, you know, just hack into other people's accounts, and it is a very strict and limited um, approach that they will get to computers. And we can certainly make that uh, possible if we choose to, so that learners can reach out into a wider community and realise that actually, you know, they they are part of a wider world, um, and and develop this culture of learning. Again, my own research focused very much on paramilitaries and how they learnt because they had a 95% uh, engagement rate with education, whereas non-aligned uh, prisoners would have had a much lower rate. And the idea is that it's a culture of learning. It was expected when they went into a, to a prisoner, prison that they would learn, that they would be engaged in certain programmes. They were told what to, what to, to do. They also had set, teachers set up on the, from within their own ranks, teaching on the wings. Those are the sorts of things that we need to be looking at to develop this idea that if you go to a young offender centre, you are there as a learning experience and you do not have the option, if you like, to, to opt out. The idea again of external links, looking outwards rather than looking inwards all the time because we're talking about very closed systems at the moment who don't really engage with the community outside I know there are lots of good work going on in terms of getting work placements and you know, getting links with the wider community, but that all needs to be developed so much more. And the idea of rehabilitation, because as I said, the costs of not looking at that are just too great in terms of our future and our generations to come. These young people will go out, they will have families, they will have children, they will be part of the you know, the wider world for many years to come because they are so young, many of them when they first enter the system. So, you know, the opportunity costs there to us as a society if we don't tackle this um, and really get to grips with the opportunities that are there. Okay, um, uh, thank you very much for listening to me. I have no idea how long I took. Did I go over or under? I have no idea.